Hello and welcome to the workshop on Pest Partners, a project to help museums and heritage organisations after the COVID-19 lockdown. I'm Vic Harding, the Programme Manager for South West Museum Development. And I'm Helena Jeschke, the Conservation Development Officer. And we're here to tell you about our project, how and why we created it, and to share with you some of the reasons why we got involved. Let us take you back to earlier this year. The national lockdown was announced in March and museum and heritage organisations were required to close. Many of these museums had no staff in attendance at all and others were operating with only minimal visits, usually once a week. Unfortunately, this coincided with the peak period of pest activity when many adults emerged to mate and lay eggs, spreading infestations through the collections. This year, there were few people present to inhibit their activity or even monitor it. We knew we needed to act. We are Southwest Museum Development. Our role is to provide museum professionals, volunteers and trustees with practical, hands-on support and development services. Our development programme is focused around four key themes, audience development, digital engagement, sustainable volunteering and collections. We already provide training and online resources on pest management. Here are a few of them. They are available free on our website, www.southwestmuseums.org.uk. We'll show the address again at the end of this workshop. With museums facing extra difficulties, we wanted to do more. It would be helpful if we could provide free kits to help them with monitoring and treating pest infestations. And it would be great if we could help a wider range of organisations normally outside our remit. With many organisations gathering pest data at the same time, it would be an ideal opportunity to gather data for scientific use. All this would take extra funding though. Fortunately, Historic England announced their Emergency Recovery Fund. We thought that this project was a perfect fit for their criteria. With a short deadline, we would have to work fast to secure this additional funding, but the upside was that there would be minimal delay in getting help to collections. Whilst designing the project, we kept several things clearly in mind. We started with making sure we matched the aims of the emergency funding. We identified clear outcomes and we kept focus on our key goals, not getting sidelined and keeping the needs of the project beneficiaries at the forefront of the design. We had to be realistic about what was achievable, balancing between the bare minimum and a more complicated project. We also needed to be realistic about our capacity to deliver the project as we are a very small team at Southwest Museum Development. We also needed to keep focus on timescales. Emergency funded projects needed to wrap up by December 2020. We worked closely with the funder and took on board their input. And we also ran a draft of the project past people who weren't involved. This is a great way to find out if we had explained things clearly and if we had left anything out. Finally, of course, we wanted to give it a clear and memorable name. And so, with huge thanks to Historic England, Pest Partners could begin. It was designed to support 200 heritage sites or organisations in the region. They did not have to be a museum or even a charity or not-for-profit, as long as they held a collection that was normally accessible by the public in some way, they could take part. Our aims were simple. We wanted the organisations to be more aware of the problems of pests and become more confident in dealing with them. We wanted to find local entomologists and encourage them to help. The data gathered would be made available for scientific research on the changing populations of pests in the regions and hopefully inform our understanding of the impact. If the climate is becoming warmer and wetter, this is likely to change the range of various pest species. We also wanted to use the project to improve pest management for all. 
We have considerable experience running projects with a cohort of small organisations, so we knew it was important to make sure organisations understood what they were committing to with the Charter. They would then receive a pest monitoring kit and guidance on identifying pests. They would check their traps monthly and send in the results using an online survey, which would make handling the data quicker and easier. We will then analyse and publish the results. The pest partners would receive guidance on monitoring for pests and support when dealing with infestations they found. For the longer term, they would also be helped to create an integrated pest management plan or review an existing one. Another important element was the need to increase the number of people prepared to tackle pest management. Many small organisations have struggled to find enough people willing to do this, and the project would create resources to help them increase the involvement, confidence and hopefully enthusiasm of a larger team. They have helplines for further support. As soon as we received the welcome news that the application had been successful, we needed to let organisations know about the project. We set up a dedicated email address and used our website newsletter to inform museums. However, getting the message out to historic houses, private collections and other heritage organisations was a bit more challenging, especially as so many of our usual network meetings and activities were paused. So we worked together with Historic England's press team who shared the project through their networks, and we all use social media to spread the news. In addition, we sent direct invitations to historic houses and other organisations. In fact, Helena even went on BBC local radio stations to broadcast the news. It was useful that the take up of our communications during those early months of the lockdown had increased significantly. We used our website as a key communication tool, enabling us to host resources and our then weekly newsletter provided practical and clear information to keep everybody in the region informed and up to date. Every pest partner applicant was sent the charter. We asked them to provide two contacts in case one person was called away. We knew through our museum development work how important it was not to rely on only one contact in order to ensure the pest monitoring could continue. Since many organisations were closed, we made sure to ask for a suitable postal address for the kits. We now have more than 90 organisations signed up as pest partners across the South West. Museums, libraries, archives, churches, historic houses and others. The monitoring kits contained blunder traps to catch crawling and flying insects and a suitable pen to mark them. An illuminated loop was chosen after considerable research that would give a clear view and coloured pens were provided to mark each pest as it was recorded. Full instructions were provided. In addition, we recorded three short how-to videos with Lightbox Media from Hale in Cornwall, which are hosted on our website. They show people how to number and date each trap, make a plan of the museum and mark the trap on it, then fold the trap up ready for use. Bend the trap into shape. It's important to place traps where insects are likely to be and make it hard for them to avoid walking inside. Traps for crawling insects are placed against walls in darker, quiet areas near entrances and exits. The traps for flying insects use a sticky card with a pheromone which attracts webbing clothes moths and pale-backed clothes moths. Cards with a different pheromone are also available. These traps can be hung or placed on walls, again in areas where the insects are likely to be. Since they contain a pheromone which will attract the male moths, we don't recommend putting them very near external doors or windows. Once a month, the pest partners need to check the traps. 
it's really important to do this effectively so that it is easier to identify the pests. So we created a video for this as well. We advise people to practice using the loop and to have good lighting. It makes a dramatic difference in your ability to see and identify the pest. We provided identification guides to the key species we were looking for. We chose 28 species which we felt were the most likely to cause problems, the most likely to be found, and the easiest to identify. We provided resources so people could record what they found and suggested sending in photos of anything that they couldn't resolve. The illuminated loop was chosen because it provides a good clear image to the naked eye and to a smartphone camera so it is easier to record what has been found. You can use the camera handheld or even rest it on a support for steadier shots. The online survey was designed to lead pest partners through entering their data in easy steps. An ID number meant data could always be correctly assigned and drop-down menus meant that it could be completed quickly for each trap. Pests found in other locations could also be recorded. For each trap, they could enter multiple choices with up to three species of beetle, moth or other, as adults, larva or empty cases. Up to 21 species could be recorded on one trap. The number of individuals in each category is recorded and there is a free text comments box for other observations. The 28 types we chose included 26 pests, including many that eat plant materials, such as seeds and dried plants, glue and size, as well as cellulose in the form of paper or wood. In addition, three of the species which don't attack wood can bore into it as the larva begin to pupate. Other pests primarily eat animal materials such as skins, horn, soft tissues attached to skeletal remains, organic coatings and, and residues. Some species cause damage while feeding on mould formed on the surface of objects or on other detritus such as fluff and shed skin particles. It's important to remember that many pest species will adapt and eat other materials besides the ones they are supposed to prefer. In addition to these 26 pests, we asked people to record the number of two sorts of spiders, the woodlouse spider and any other spiders. These are useful indicators of a plentiful supply of prey species, which may not be showing up in the traps. In addition, the woodlouse spiders show that there may be damp areas nearby and or easy access to outside areas. We have received the records from pest partners for the first few months and already some notable finds have occurred. If you don't like spiders, please close your eyes for this slide. In particular, several museums have noted false widow spiders both outside and inside their buildings. This is not a cause for alarm, but a good reminder to wear gloves if you are moving boxes in undisturbed buildings and can't see where you're putting your hands. Another interesting find is the grey silverfish, a larger, hairier species than our native silverfish, shown here for comparison. This was first documented in the UK in 2014 and has spread across southern regions. To date, these are the most common finds. Not surprisingly, there are, sadly, a large number of spiders attracted to the traps by the presence of prey species or just blundering in on their way through the area. Silverfish, woodlouse and booklouse finds show that the relative humidity is too high in many of the collections. As we come to the end of the year and this phase of the project, we'll be gathering the data from the last month and then analysing it all. With pest partners, we'll be planning how to deal with the infestations or improve conditions before the next spring emergence, and we'll be providing help. In addition, we are creating some further resources to help the pest partners expand their workforce with a card game and an animated film explaining the museum life of pests. 
please do watch our website and see how this develops to hear our news. We have one last thought. Would you like to help this project? We'd be very interested to hear from you, especially if you study climate change or pest populations. Perhaps you have some tips you'd like to share or some photographs of pest damage you would be willing to allow us to use. What ideas do you have for future pest projects? Please get in touch by email pestmartners at gmail.com. And finally, a really big thank you to Historic England for funding this project and of course to you for watching this presentation.